Hello. This is another beautiful day. This is the revision show on Joy Learning Channel. I am your facilitator for today, and my name is Adriana Benyabua. I'll be taking us through a revision show on government. Today we are going to discuss a very beautiful and interesting topic. One that is very common in our very neighborhoods because at least everybody is living within a particular area. Could be a district, you could also be known, it could also be known as a constituency or whatever. But wherever you are in Ghana, you live in a particular area. And we're going to talk about issues that deal with these local areas in which we live. So this is what we'll talk about today. Local government authority or administration. I guess that you understand the word local, which means that grassroots down to our level. And basically it would mean that there is an element of governance in our local area. Today, by the time we are done, then at least you, my friends out there, should be able to define what local government authority is. You should be able to explain its functions and problems it poses or it has. You should also be able to highlight its sources of revenue, as well as ways and means to ensure that these revenue sources are sustained. And then we'll be answering some questions on the topic. Let's set the ball rolling today. What is local government administration or local government authority? Basically, we'll have about three definitions, and you will decide which one you'll be able to understand better. It is defined as government at the grassroots level, established by an act of parliament to perform specific functions within its jurisdiction. So when we talk about an act of parliament, act of parliament, when we're in the first year, we're taught about the judiciary, as well as the legislative arm of government and the executive. And we were told that it is the prerogative right or it is the basic right of the legislative arm of government to make laws. So when we say act, act means the law or statutes. So we say that it is established by a law of, a law of parliament or the law of the legislative assembly to perform specific functions within its jurisdiction or the area in which that particular grassroots administration is found. It can also be defined as a sub-governmental body established by an act of parliament to perform legislative and executive functions to support the central government. So, if, for example, in Ghana, we have what we call the unitary system, where all powers and functions are located at the center, which is the central government. It is this particular central government that's put in place with, with respect or with the approval of the legislative arm of government through an act of parliament put in place a sub-governmental body, that is, a governmental body that assists the central government to perform some functions. And we've made them clear that they are legislative and executive in nature. By this time, you should know what legislative arm of government is or what legislative functions are. And you should also know what executive functions are. Let's go to our third definition. We say that this is a semi-autonomous body established by the central government through an act of parliament to provide political administration at the local level. So basically what we are trying to talk about here is the fact that when we talk about local government administration, it's an opportunity given to the local people or people at the grassroots, to be able to administer governance by themselves. In one way or the other, we say that it helps the people to acknowledge that they are part of the governing system. Not that government is so far away. It makes, if there was nothing like that, it would mean that governance would be so remote. So this time, it is in the local area. We call this the local government administration, where somehow they are semi-autonomous. We say they are somehow independent, yet they are monitored and supervised by other bigger bodies, or sometimes the central government, so that they do not go out of line or go unconstitutional. Now that we have known this, let's see something here. 
because it is an act of parliament and it is because parliament decides it so and it came into being in in the first republican constitution in 1992 where the constitution made provision for the um, the presence of a local government body so that it enhances democracy is that right good and we say that and when we go to the entire chapter 20 is 24 or 20 is dedicated to the local government administration in establishing local government authority the act of parliament determines and specifies the following one its powers so we are talking about the fact that the act of parliament will determine the powers of the local government it determines what it can do the powers it can expel the functions it can perform the required personnel it needs so that Governance can be achieved and democracy can be experienced right down to the local level, as well as its limitations or constraints, where what it can do, what it can affect, and what it cannot affect. Basically, when we talk about local government administration, this is what it is. I want you to understand it. That basically, we say that it is an act of parliament that brings it into being one. Two, we say that it is semi autonomous, partly independent partly non-independent. They are monitored by the central government. Sometimes they, are, they go through or they implement directives from the central government. Then they are also in a way um, quite autonomous and they are a sub-governmental body. Having said this, let's go on. In most cases, we say that the local government administration is not only experienced in Ghana, it's experienced in almost all most democratic states in, in the world. There are three types of them, which we haven't actually outlined here. But I guess that by this time, most of our teachers would have treated this. One of them is the councillor system, where um, the, there's, a, there's an election, or we say that these are appointments or elections by the central government that elects a councillor. In Britain, the councillor is known as the mayor. In Ghana, we call the, that particular person the district chief executive. Then when you go to France, they have the prefectorial system where the, there is a body that elects a prefect, a, a, a council of heads, or we talk about the council, that at the head of the council is the prefect, and the prefect oversees to the administration at the local level. Then the third one is known as the city manager system where there is what we call the indirect college or we call them the indirect system of government so an electoral college is formed by um, a, a group of councillors and then they now would elect what we call a manager to effect changes within the local areas basically gun uses the councillor system and so we have the district chief executive Let's look at, let's now look at the structure of Ghana's local government authority. Because it is an act of parliament, as well as, 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 as a bit to bring governance to the local people, there is a ministry of local government. Currently in Ghana, uh, this particular ministry is known as local government, decentralization, and rural development. Is that right? So it carries the same weight as what, is what I have outlined here. Let's look at what it is. So we talk about the Ministry of Local Government. It is part of the civil service established by law. You know what a civil service is? I want to believe that by now you know that the executive arm of government is in faces, or it has parts. Parts, and it has the implementation parts. The formulating part is the, the president, the vice, and cabinet. Is that all right? Then we come to the civil service. That is where the implementation is. And so as part of the civil service, the Ministry of Local Government is, in effect, a body that enhances the implementation of policies that, that helps the development of the local level or the local areas in Ghana. It is normally headed by a minister. I want you to right now find through some means of yours 
to know who the current minister is for local government decentralization and rural development in Ghana. I hope you are doing that now. Good. So you should know by now who he is. The ministry supervises and controls all local government institutions. So basically, when we talk about the Ministry of Local Government, its major duty uh, is that it should be able to supervise and control all local government institutions. When we go down, we'll find more of these local government institutions and why we say that they supervise and control these local government institutions. It is also responsible for the management of finance of local government institutions in Ghana. And it also implements policies from the central government. So when we say the Ministry of Local Government, this is what it is, that it is a ministry under the executive. And basically what it does is that it supervises and controls all local government administrations in Ghana. It is also responsible for the management of finance, of local, or financing, um, the mode of finance, revenue, um, points and sources, and auditing of local government institutions in Ghana. And then it also helps the central government to implement policies to help the local people. Now that we've talked about the first structure, we'll now go to the second structure. The second structure, now we are from the region. We've gone through the national. We've now come to the region. And we now have the Regional Coordinating Council. I hope that as you listen to news, you, you may have heard um, the mention of this particular council, the Regional Coordinating Council, RCC. It is made up of the regional minister who is the chairman of the council. Um, the regional chairman, or the, sorry, the regional minister is an appointee of government, is appointed by the president, vetted by the legislature. When I say vetted by the legislature, I hope you understand. It is also one of the functions of the legislative arm of government. And it is a committee. They are part of a committee in parliament. They are known as the vetting committee of parliament. They would vet the deputy minister. You also understand why they vet them. To see how competent and efficient they can be in the positions they are going to hold. Then after they have been vetted and put there, they are the chairman of the council. Then there is a deputy regional minister who assists the regional ministers. There is also, in, as part of this particular council, there is the presiding members of each district in the region. When we say district, we say it is a generic term used for the capacity or the population of a particular group, a particular area. It could be an ordinary district, it could be a municipal, it could be a metropolitan. And so when we say district, we are meaning the three together. And therefore, for each of these districts, whether it's a municipal, whether it is a metropolitan, whether it's an ordinary district, each one of them has what we call or have what we call the presiding member. The presiding member presides over the meetings of these groups of districts I have outlined. The district chief executive of each district in the region is also part of this composition. So now we talk about the regional minister who chairs this particular council at every meeting. There is a deputy regional minister who would assist the regional minister. There is a presiding members of every district in the region. There is a district chief executive of every district in the region. And there are regional heads of decentralized ministries without voting rights. So we talk about directors of health. We talk about uh, directors of education and the rest. They are all part of this particular composition. But unfortunately or fortunately, they do not vote when there is an issue on the floor which requires voting. They do not vote. So those who vote in this particular instance is the regional minister, the deputy regional minister, the district chief executive of each district in the region and presiding members all made up within a region. So let's say, for example, Greater Accra. Greater Accra is a, is a metropolitan system, isn't it? And within the metropolis are districts. 
at every point in time as a metropolitan system or a metropolitan um, assembly when they meet at the regional coordinating, uh, regional coordinating council, you would find regional, the regional minister, Greater Accra regional minister, you find his deputy regional ministers, presiding members of every district in Greater Accra. So Greater Accra is made up of several districts and every district has either I mean, it's either a municipal or a, a normal or an ordinary district. And each of them has a presiding member. They would all be within the council. Then there will be the district chief executive, municipal chief executive, metropolitan chief executive present at the regional coordinate as, as, as part of the composition of the regional coordinating council. Have we gotten this one right? Very good. As part of this council, but they do not vote, is what we call regional heads of decentralized ministries. When we say decentralization, I hope you understand. Okay, so we want to do a little refreshment. We say that decentralization is a system or a form through which governance is done, where we say that functions and powers of government are shared between the central government and other units of government, example, the local government. Have we gotten this one right? When we say decentralization, we say that it is a, a system for, of governance where functions and powers are shared between the central government and local units or the governmental units under the central government. And we have three types of them. We have devolution, we have delegation, and we have deconcentration. Basically, Ghana uses what we call the deconcentration system where it is a system where power from the central government is sent or given to the local levels to govern administratively in terms of executive and legislative function. So this is what it means. Under that, as well, we will find that apart from the Minister of Health, he would now, would now um, delegate or possibly appoint all right, the central government will also appoint directors in charge under the Minister of Health or Minister of Education. We call this decentralized system. Is that right? We bring down the ministries right down to the people so that they can feel government. Good. Let's see the functions of the RCC or the Regional Coordinating Council. Let's look at their functions. Basically, what they do is that they monitor and supervise the operations of the district assembly. I've already told you that when we say district assemblies, it's a generic term. We'll come to understand it later. That they monitor and supervise the operations of the district assemblies, and they coordinate and evaluate the performance of the assemblies to ensure efficiency. Now, we say that the local people should be able to govern themselves. All right, through a local administration or a local government administration. We say government at the grassroots. People should be able to experience government and should be able to be, to be, they should be able to feel and become part of governance. When it is so, then there must be a higher body that supervises governance at the grassroots. And one of them is the RCC or the Regional Coordinating Council. So they will monitor the activities of the district assemblies, sometimes they will supervise. At some times, they will redirect the implementation of policies at the local level. Then they coordinate and evaluate the performance, whether it is helping the people or whether it is rather putting them into more problems. Then they will be able to see if there could be changes or whatever, so that there can be the issue of efficiency. You live in a particular area, and I know we are not talking about constituencies here because we are not talking about election. I hope you have understood. So now we come down to the grassroots, and we talk about district assemblies. We talk about district assemblies. And so we say that it is a second level administrative subdivisions in Ghana, below the levels of region. So we are done with the region. We are now in the district. So when we talk about district assemblies, we say that for effective governance, Ghana has been divided into districts. For effective what? 
governance. Ghana has been divided into several districts. The term district is a generic term that could mean one. District assemblies. So when we talk about district assemblies, we are talking about a local government administration that oversees to an area with a minimum population of 75,000 people. So where the area or that particular local area has a population of 75,000 people or below, they qualify to have a district assembly. Is that one gone in right? Then when we come to a municipal assembly, it ranges from 75,000 to 95,000 people. When we have this population at a particular area or locality, it, is, it has the mandate to gain a municipal assembly. Is that right? So we talk about somewhere like Ashaman. Ashaman is now a municipality. So the issue is that its population ranges between 75,000 to 95,000 people. Then we talk about the metropolitan assemblies. They also range between 95,000, a population of 95,000 people to 250,000 people. Now we have about um, a number of these districts or generic term used as districts. In Ghana, we have about 260 districts. So when I'm saying 260 districts, I'm talking not about ordinary districts. We are talking about the generic term used for the three categories I've outlined. Now, we have 145 districts in Ghana. These are ordinary districts. I hope you are making the differentiations. Very good. Then we have 109 municipals, and we have six metropolitan assemblies. These metropolitan assemblies are Greater Accra, Tema, Kumase, Cape Coast, Sekendi Itakrade, and Tamale. So let's go over them and see. Let's see. If what I said, you can also go through with it. Let's go. Accra, or Greater Accra. Tema. Sekendi Itakrade. Yes. Cape Coast. Tamale. And, and Kumase. How many have we outlined? Six. Well, the municipals are about 109, so we can mention them, all of them. And then we can't also mention... Um, all the districts. But where I live, I live within a municipal. I live in Ablekuma West, which is a municipal. So that is it. It means that that particular area has a population of about 75,000 to 95,000 people. Have we understood this very well? So this is what we call the district assembly system. These categories are found within the assemblies. Very good. So let's see what they do. Let's see what the district assemblies are. First and foremost, we say that they monitor. Sorry about that. Let's talk about its composition first. Like we did for the RCC or the Regional Coordinating Council. I hope you remember that one. Very good. Now, when we talk about the composition of the district assemblies, we talk about the political head, which is the district chief executive. He is appointed by the president and approved by not less than two-thirds majority of members present at the time of voting. So every assembly has its own members. All right? Every assembly, whether municipal, whether metropolitan, whether it is an ordinary district, it has its own members. Now, before a district chief executive is, is allowed to take office in a particular or is given the mandate to administer a particular district assembly, whether municipal, whether an ordinary district, whether it is a metropolitan. This is how he gets in there. First of all, he must be an appointee of the president. He's appointed. And then he's sent into the district assembly. At a scheduled or at a scheduled date, voting takes place. That the people who are supposed to be members shouldn't be too sad. The, the, the mandate or possibly the electoral system allows that the people who would vote, all right, for that particular person to become the district chief executive shouldn't be two thirds majority. So let's say they are about 30. Let's say members in a particular municipal assembly is about 30. They are about 30. It will mean that when it comes to 
voting, 20 people should have voted in favor of that particular person, assuming the office of a chief executive. And that gives that particular person the thumbs up to be able to administer that particular local government administration. Have we understood it? Yes, that is the technicality prescribed by the Constitution. Then, in addition to that, there must be one person from each local government's electoral area by universal adult suffrage. I'll take that one again. There should be one person from each local government's electoral area by universal adult suffrage. These are what we call the assembly men or women. You remember the once in a while, I think for every two years, we go through an electoral system to elect assembly men and women. They, this is, they are also a composition of the district assembly. Then other members, not less than 30% of the total numbers of the assembly, appointed by the president in consultation with interest groups and traditional authorities in the district. So then the president ha would also, in consultation with some interest groups. Now when you come into our district or the areas in which we live, we have interest groups, right? We have um, hairdressing associations. We have um, market women associations and the rest. Then we have the traditional authorities, the chiefs, the nam mayors, and the rest. And these traditional authorities and interest groups, um, the president would do this in consultation with them. He would sit with them and would find out or would, would pick up people within the local areas. And they shouldn't be less than... 30% of the total numbers of, or the total members of the assembly. So basically, this is the composition. When you go into any district assembly, you would find the composition as this. In addition to this, the member of parliament of that area is also a member of, or is part of the assembly. There could be one, there could be two. But the, 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 the member of parliament for the area is also a member of the district assembly. I hope you have gotten that one right. For those of us who would want to go into district local government administration, these are the qualifications for membership into the district assemblies or local government. First and foremost, you must be a citizen of Ghana. Who is a citizen? We say it is membership a country. And in Ghana, you can be a citizen through birth to either a Ghanaian parent. Not the fact that you are born here to foreigners or a foreign parent to maybe, let's say, you are, you are from Togo. Mother is a Togolese and a father is a Togolese. And you come to live in Ghana and you haven't naturalized. It doesn't make you an automatic Ghanaian. You should be born um, to a Ghanaian mother, a Ghanaian father, or a Ghanaian grandparent then you could have been adopted. And when we say adoption, we are not talking about foster parents. This is when a child born between, a child of the ages of day one to I think before 18 years, goes through a legal process of the courts. And the parents are given or allowed to adopt the child through the legal process. Is that right? Then you can also naturalize as well. This is also one of the jobs of, or one of the functions of the courts. Then you should be a registered voter. How can you become a member of a district assembly or a particular um, organization or possibly um, a governing body of Ghana when you are not registered? Now who votes for you? You must be um, a registered voter. You should, be eight, you should be 18 years and above and of sound mind. You must have hailed from the area. So hell there means that you should have been born. You should, that should be your home, hometown. Should be coming from that area. Is that right? And you, should, you may have lived there. You should have lived there for at least five years. You must hail from the area and must have lived there for at least five years. Then you must have fulfilled all tax obligations. It means that you are a taxpayer. And if you, are do, if you are into business, you should have been, um, there should be records that you are not evading tax. If you are in a government system, there should be records that you are a taxpayer and do not evade tax. 
And then you must not be a convicted or wanted criminal. So you shouldn't have gone, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't be, excuse me to say, a jailbird. Um, when, after that, you shouldn't be somebody wanted by government or known to be of a scrupulous behavior. Then you can apply to become, you can apply to become a district, it could be part of the local government administration. Let's look at the functions of the assembly. First of all, they enact, or they, there's enactment and enforcement of bylaws. What are bylaws? Bylaws are, um, are allowed or they are mandated by the legislative arm of government through an instrument known as delegated legislature. It is when parliament delegates some of its powers to some um, bodies in the system to be able to use them to make laws to govern their areas of jurisdiction. One of them is the making of bylaws, and it is done by the district assemblies, which means that the district assemblies, the municipal assemblies, the metropolitan assemblies can, can enact laws. It means they can make their own laws. I, I think that when you go to, let's say, uh, Accra Metropolitan Assembly, you would find that they have their own laws. But the laws do not contradict the Constitution, the, the 1992 Republican Constitution. It does not contradict it. It should be in alignment with the Constitution so that it does not infringe on the rights of individuals. I should guess that one of them is the fact that you can't sell on pavements. You know what pavements are? Where pedestrians walk so that they are not knocked down by cars. Yes, and so once in a while you hear the word abaye, where people or sellers sell at unauthorized areas. And when they are caught, they are prosecuted. All right, so they pay fines and stuff so that next time it sells as a deterrent so that they do not sell there again. And when they make their bylaws, they enforce them. Yes. Once in a while, you see them on the streets trying to put their place in order. And they, that is an enforcement of the laws within the district, within the metropolitans and the municipal assembly. They also maintain law and order. Is that right? They also maintain law and order. They see to it that there is law and order. Uh, in fact, when you, I think when you come to Accra, you would find some areas, especially where there are traffic lights. In the past, you see city guards. I don't know if they are still around. Where you find them making sure that traffic is less, there is less congestion on our streets. People don't sell things at unauthorized areas. People do not sell foods that are not wholesome for the um, local area. Then once in a while, there are meetings to educate the people or the local people on their rights and duties. One of the functions of the district assemblies, when I say district assemblies, I mean the ordinary districts, municipals, and metropolitans. Once in a while, there's a meeting or a forum, sometimes seminars within the district, where a subsection of the public, especially people in the communities, are, are invited to be educated. Resource persons are invited. People who are good at the law are, are invited to teach or to educate and enlighten the local people on their rights and duties. And then they have the power to impose and collect taxes, levies, rates, licenses, and the rest. Now, the fact is that at the local level, because it is governance, there must be developmental projects. And it is done with funds or revenue. And so the district assemblies, the municipal assemblies, and the metropolitan assemblies have that particular function to impose taxes, all right, in, 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 in accordance to some of their laws. And then they, are, they also have the mandate to collect these taxes. And um, I, I remember at one point in time in my home, we were given a letter for property rate by the district assembly that um, the property that we owned, that is the house, should pay the rates um, within the district. Then once in a while, when you come to Accra Central, you see some men with bags around their, their, their heads, around their necks, collecting levies and tolls from the women who sell and from shops. These are from the assembly, and it is one of their mandates. It is one of the functions they perform. Apart from that, 
They also provide, there's a provision of educational or education facilities. In some cases, uh, at some local levels, um, the district assemblies undertake educational developmental projects such as the um, construction or the building of daycare centers, sometimes basic schools if they can afford them, in partnership with other sponsors. And this is another function they perform. Apart from that, they also help in the provision of markets, slaughterhouses, and recreational facilities and the rest. Now, I think that when you come to Accra, I'm going to use Accra because basically this is where I am. So I give examples where it's quite applicable. But then you go to Kumasi, it's the same. You go to Tamale, it's the same. And so you would realize that there is the provision of markets and slaughterhouses. And when you go to, for example, um, Accra, you come to Mokola, you go to um, Agbogloshi, and the rest, uh, Salag, and the rest, they, these are markets that are structured by the district assemblies to aid in commercial, and commercial functions and businesses. So we talked about the fact that the district assemblies also had the power to provide for, they, they, they were responsible for providing for markets and slaughterhouses. And I think that earlier we said that when you come to some parts of a car, um, they provided uh, markets for people. Um, at sometimes uh, I think that uh, you only pay for a little fee and you are given a space in the market to do some commercial businesses. And then slaughterhouses are also built. Regularly, they, they would supervise and see how, how well the place is being managed. And then that is it. As a matter of fact, one of their functions as well is to supervise or uh, to, to make sure that there's a good layout of the area and will sanction unauthorized buildings and their owners. So um, one thing is that they help in... Uh, making sure that a particular area within their jurisdiction or the jurisdiction in which the district assembly was had a very good layout. And so we said that when a good layout is done in a particular settlement, there are roads, there are places where there should be a cemetery, a place for a recreational center, a place for a market, a school, and the rest. And this is one of the major functions of the district assemblies. I don't know if you realize, for those of us in Accra and Kumase, once in a while you find an uncompleted building with an inscription on it, produce permits, which means that, that the, 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 the building was constructed without the authorization of the district assembly. Sometimes they say remove by AME or KME. And so you realize that they are doing their job very well. And it is their function. Another thing is that they provide sanitation and conservancy, conservancy services, uh, places where we conserve things. Um, I don't know if you've also realized that once in a while, or most of the time, especially during this COVID time, you realize that um, some places of Accra would see the compaction trucks that collect refuse every morning from some places to a, a deposit um, dumping site. And you see the inscription on these big vehicles or these big, big trucks. Um, maybe AMA or KMA or TMA, and you realize that it is their function and their performing it that they make sure that the area in which they jurisdict is clean and healthy so that people do not get sick. Once in a while, you would find them spraying some chemicals on some dumping sites. Sometimes they will come around, spray some chemicals on the, in, within the environment, which is not too harmful, but then would help to eradicate diseases, sometimes by conducting extermination exercises and programs. So that is what they do. They would, once in a while, they, they would invite some fumigation experts and sometimes some extermination experts where there is the outbreak of malaria, um, outbreak of um, cholera, and they would spray the site so that it doesn't contaminate and cause diseases. Then there is another function they perform. They inspect eating places. So when we talk about eating places, we are talking about chop bars, restaurants, and the KK seller with, his, with her 
two bench and, 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 and a, a table and all that, the cocoa seller and the rest, as well as the food sellers. Quite recently, a food seller told me that she was supposed to go and um, um, go through an examination for, 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 re for health reasons. And she should be able to provide a certificate that showed that she had gone for some lab test showing she's healthy enough to sell what she's selling. And it, it says it's from the district assembly. And I think it's also good. They also name streets. Quite recently, too, you see that in Accra, there are new signposts with names of um, indigenous people of the area being named after the streets. And they do the naming of the streets. They are also responsible for street lights in the areas they jurisdict. So you realize that once in a while you see them going around, the assemblies go around. Um, if there is, a, there is no light, they would erect a street light, the pole for the street light. Once in a while you see them changing the bulbs of the street light. Then they also construct pavements where contractors had um, built roads and had left no place for pedestrians. It is also their responsibility to pave a place for pedestrians to be safe from cars or vehicles. Then they also construct community centers. Um, in some areas, in some districts, you find that there is a community center where there is a place where young people can go and exercise, um, have a little fun in the rest. You find a volleyball court, you find a netball pole, you find football. Sometimes it's not as modern as it is, but you find an area demarcated with poles where young people can go there and exercise. So basically, we've talked about the structure of Ghana's local government. And we've talked about the ministry headed by a minister with two deputies. I'm also going to give you a little assignment. In, in your own time, you are going to look for the name of the minister, the current minister for local government, decentralization, and rural development. You should be able to do that. And the two deputies, if they have been, um, I think two of them have been, um, they have gone through a, a vetting process by parliament, and they have been um, given the thumbs up and approval. So you are going to look for their names. It's for your perusal. It is for your benefit. Go and go and look for their names. Very good. Then we've also talked about the Regional Coordinating Council. After the executive, the central government will now come to the regional level where we have the Regional Coordinating Council. Is that right? Then from there, we come to the district, um, district assemblies. Then we have the zonal area. I'll we'll talk about the zonal system where in... Uh, 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 Two or three areas will come together to, to form a zone. Then we, we, will, we would also have what we call the town council or the area council over which the assemblyman jurisdicted, as well as the unit committee members. Basically, when we talk about the district assembly, this is what, basically when we talk about the local government administration in Ghana, this is what we are talking about. I hope that this had gone down well. You have understood quite well. Let's see if we can answer a few wasi questions. Just about two or three of them. Highlight six challenges facing district assemblies in Ghana. Highlight six challenges facing district assemblies in Ghana. Yes. Where you are, I hope you are, you are trying to find answers. Highlight six challenges facing district assemblies in Ghana. I hope your pens are out and you are writing. Yes. I hope you can write more than six. Good. Let's see if your answers are close to what I have. 
they may, they may not differ exactly, possibly because of um, the way we've structured it. Let's see if what I have is what you have. You may have more. Good. So inadequate revenue base. When we looked at their functions, you remember we talked a lot about their functions where we said that they are responsible for the construction of markets, um, they, they, they undertake developmental projects, they educate the people, and a whole lot. It goes with revenue, it goes with funds. And because their revenue base is a little small, it becomes a big challenge for them. Let's see if we can mention some of their revenue bases. Okay, so you realize that uh, their revenue base is quite, quite challenging. Good. Then the second one is that there is a misappropriation of funds. When we say misappropriation, it's different from embezzlement. When we say misappropriation, we say that funds are given for a particular purpose, and if they don't serve that purpose for which the funds are given, it becomes misappropriation. So I give you money to go and buy me a bag. On the way, you saw a basket that you felt that would be better than the bag. So you use the money instead of buying the bag to buy the basket. You have misappropriated the funds. You have used it for the wrong reasons why they were given. So then it also happens in the district assemblies. Then there's high level of corruption, right? Where, um, excuse me to say, hands that go into the purse and activities that go around the district assemblies are sometimes a little, unfortunately, a little corrupt where monies or gifts are taken, bribes are taken here and there, people are, are asked to, you know, all those things that breeds corruption. Then there is political interference, where the central government interferes with the work of the district assemblies, the municipal assemblies, and the metropolitan assemblies. Sometimes uh, there, there isn't really a clear-cut as, as to what the central, where the central government cannot come in and where it can come in at a point in time, it interferes politically in the affairs. And especially when there is a coup d'etat, where a military government or um, a rebel group takes over governance, then politically it also interferes with the activities and the operations of the district assemblies. Then there's inadequate skilled personnel. One challenge the district assemblies are facing is the fact that square pegs are put into round holes. And it makes work quite difficult. It also does not give the assemblies the best. They should be able to have their own auditors, their own accountants, their own secretaries, the everything as a package so that there is efficiency and there is development at the grassroots level. At most times, we say that because it's just a district assembly and the district chief executive is there and all that. But then there should be a proper system where skilled personnel, people who have, have worked towards or had learned, had studied, are having experiences with regards to what entails or what it entails to be part of the district assembly. They are employed so that we can find some sort of, or we could be experiencing some competent and efficient running of the district assemblies. Then there's a poor work ethics. Hmm? I think you've heard that word. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. People will go to work late. People will leave. On Friday, for example, by 12 o'clock, people are already home. People are at funerals, and the assembly has been left there. People come to work, and instead of doing what they have been asked to work for or what they have been asked to work on, um, they, are, they are doing their own thing. This time, it's not even the lot of papers. Lots of papers are no longer there, isn't it? So we have the Twitter, the WhatsApp, and then there is the, the other one. Mm -hmm. Good. People are online doing business whilst they should be doing the work of the assembly. So these are challenges that... Um, face the district, the municipal, and the metropolitan assemblies. Now, I guess that if I asked you to tell me how these can be corrected, 
then you'll be able to tell me some ways and means by which these challenges can be addressed. If I ask you to suggest solutions as to how governments or the central government can improve on the activities of the district assemblies, you should be able to do that for me, looking at the challenges we have. Very good. Let's look at the second question. How is local governments controlled in the exercise of their duties? Are they controlled? Are they a free range governmental system? Remember in the beginning we said that they are semi-autonomous. At a point in time we said that they are also um, a sub-governmental body. Are they controlled? In which ways are they controlled? What, who are responsible or what factors are responsible for their control? 